On April 15, 1770, Jonas Clark, a pastor in Lexington, Massachusetts, preached a sermon entitled, The Use and Excellency of Vocal Music in Public Worship. Its stated purpose was to, quote, promote and encourage the divine use of vocal music. Clark's message began with exhortations from the Old and New Testaments and continued with a challenge to worship the Lord as do the angels in heaven. Clark admonished his listeners, reprimanding them for using their voices to profane the name of God and confronting women for not singing enough. The pastor commended females' voices. Quote, Certainly no voices are so pleasant, none so sweetly melodious and engaging as those of singing women, when rightly tuned to hymns of praise. Clark ended his message with a challenge. May we hope from praising him imperfectly on earth to pass to sing in perfection above. That same year, Boston physician Dr. Joseph Warren, who would go to send Paul Revere on his famous ride to Lexington and who died in the Battle of Bunker Hill, borrowed the tune of the British Grenadiers to create war rhetoric with his lyrics entitled, Free America. Lift up your hearts, my heroes, and swing with proud disdain. The wretch that would ensnare you shall spread his net in vain. Should Europe empty all her force, we'd meet them in array. And shout huzzah, 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 for brave America. Five years later, almost to the day, the first shots of the war took place near the front of Jonas Clark's church in Lexington. Of the skirmish, Clark prophesied, from this day will be dated the liberty of the world. This is Cold Spring Presbyterian Church in Cape May, New Jersey. It was founded in the year 1714 and has been a practicing congregation for 303 years. The Great Awakening had brought Isaac Watts hymns such as When I Survey the Wondrous Cross to churches like Cold Spring Presbyterian. Further, the Wesley Brothers first hymnal published in South Carolina in 1737 had begun to spread evangelical lyrics throughout America. It included hymns like Christ the Lord is Risen Today, Pastors like Samuel Davies helped grow the popularity of hymns and the performance of anthems by trained choirs. Churches generally limited the use of instrumentation in worship music, but by the eve of the American Revolution, opinion was changing. Particularly with regard to the organ, instruments were increasingly seen as agents of inspiration, which could point listeners' hearts toward heaven. Music undoubtedly reflects and perhaps influences the emotions and motivations of people groups. Arguably, its impact is compounded in time of war. During the American Revolution, ballads, hymns, and marches provided outlets for the colonists' creative energies and collective anxieties. For the patriots, there were schools, homes, concert halls, taverns, and especially churches at which young and old gathered on a regular basis throughout the war. At these gatherings, whether scheduled or spontaneous, Americans talked, fretted, prayed, and sang. While their music did not necessarily give the Yankees a tactical advantage, it undoubtedly heightened Americans' focus and galvanized the hearts and minds of men and women in towns and cities, in the state militias and the Continental Army in the glorious cause of fighting for liberty from the crown. And even conscientious objectors were unified through their music. Several founding fathers spoke of the benefits of music to the human psyche. Dr. Benjamin Rush claimed that music, quote, civilized the mind, and that certain notes stimulated brain functions, maybe even enhancing long-term memory. 
John Adams hailed music's power of emotion, quoting, Music is capable of raising in the mind every tender, generous, noble passion and sentiment. Benjamin Franklin himself, the inventor, improved upon an instrument musical glasses, and he dubbed his invention the harmonica. Its popularity spread to Europe, and even Beethoven and Mozart asked to purchase one. Local bookstores, too, in cities like Philadelphia would sell sheet music by the latest composers from Europe, Vivaldi, Corelli, and especially George Friedrich Handel. We are going to go on a journey through South Central Pennsylvania, starting here at Beadnoggle's Evangelical Lutheran Church, just north of Palmyra. to Salem Lutheran in Lebanon, then down to Lancaster County and the Lydis Moravian Church, then across town to Ephrata Cloisters, then we'll go a longer distance to Valley Forge before returning back to Bead Noggles. On the eve of the Revolutionary War, about a dozen Reformed or Lutheran churches were dotting the countryside of present-day Lebanon, Pennsylvania, including several which still stand today, like this beautiful edifice, Salem Lutheran Church, whose first regular pastor, Frederick Augustus Conrad Muhlenberg, would go on to become Congress's first Speaker of the House of Representatives. Tradition states that July 8, 1776 was filled with alarm when a courier came into town pronouncing all must go to war by order of Congress. That courier also brought news of the recently approved Declaration of Independence. I can only imagine that it was read in this yard. By the end of July several companies had been mustered and they prepared with the singing of music According to Theodore Schmauck's 1898 work entitled Old Salem in Lebanon, quote, they sang hymns and heard a sermon and went on their way to the front, unquote. In 1756, a Moravian community was established in present-day Lidditz, Pennsylvania, which anecdotally was voted America's coolest small town in 2013. Named for a castle back in Bohemia, Lidditz was a mission field for the world's oldest international Protestant denomination, Moravians, who believed in humanitarian aid, quality education for men and women, and an interpretation of the Sermon on the Mount which forbade the swearing of oaths or the bearing of arms. They were pacifists. Moravians also believed in writing and preserving music, written, of course, in the German tongue. The present-day church building, in front of which I am standing, was completed one month prior to the ratification of the United States Constitution in 1787, and its landmark spire was designed by noted organ builder David Tannenberg, who lived here in Lidditz. Tannenberg was arguably the best organ maker in the colonies, practicing his trade for half a century. The Moravians' annual Christmas Eve candlelight service, featuring organ music and a full choir, beeswax candles, illuminated Moravian stars, and of course, a trombone ensemble, is truly a soul-moving experience. To the immediate east of the church is the Single Sisters House, America's olding, oldest boarding school for girls, which today is called Linden Hall. To the west is the Brothers House, just in the view on the right of the camera, which George Washington commandeered in December of 1777 after being defeated at Brandywine. 450 soldiers were brought into this makeshift hospital, and 120 died herein, mostly from the ravenously contagious typhoid fever. They are buried in the cemetery behind the church. While most of Lidditz Moravian's early printed music has been sent to Bethlehem 
or Winston-Salem for digitization, there are hundreds of precious memories, mementos, here in the archives, including a collection of rare brass, woodwind, and stringed instruments, the most revered of which is the first viola made in the colonies in 1762. Perhaps that very instrument inspired congregants here to pray more fervently or care for the wounded more lovingly during the glorious cause, even though church members were not engaged in the battle per se. This is your four foot flute. The, the length of pipes changes the octave. This is your eight foot gedecht. Marion, that is beautiful. And Thank this you. This is your full organ. For other conscientious objectors like the Mennonites, Amish, and Dunkard Brethren, music also played a prominent role on the Sabbath. Such was the case with the Seventh-day Baptists here at the Ephrata Cloisters. Conrad Beisel wrote many of the hymns which were sung by the Ephrata community, whose members practiced celibacy, placed themselves on a sparse vegetarian diet, and slept minimally, all in anticipation of an imminent return of Christ. The cloister worshipers also printed much of Beisel's hymns, even starting their own paper mill. While situated near Brunswick, New Jersey, on June 4, 1777, George Washington complained that the music of the army was, quote, very bad, adding, nothing is more agreeable and ornamental than good music. Every officer for the credit of his corps should take care to provide it. Washington ordered that fife and drum majors improve their training methods at the risk of demotion or, worse yet, having, quote, their extraordinary pay taken from them. The musicians rose to the challenge and it paid off eight months later. I'm standing in front of Washington's headquarters during the brutal winter of 1777-78 at Valley Forge, Pennsylvania. Outside this building, a dejected George Washington was serenaded for his birthday by the Proctor's artillery, fifers and drummers. He rewarded them with a payment of one pound ten shillings and praised them for their fortitude despite the frigid conditions. Might that surprise performance of music have made a small difference in the outcome of the winter at Valley Forge or even the war itself? We may never know that answer. Prussian-born Baron von Steuben, recruited here to raise the morale of his troops, found Washington's men in need of organization and training. So, as spring approached, they drilled. While British foot soldiers' common step averaged 60 paces per minute, American soldiers would now hoof it at 75 paces. And for either army, quick step ran to as fast as 120 steps per minute. Von Steuben recommended that instrumental music be played to enhance the speed of forming lines and the efficiency of communicating battle orders. Lieutenant John Highwell, a Fife Major in the 3rd Continental Artillery Regiment, was assigned this role. Highwell's work led to the normalization of eight-piece performing bands, including oboe, bassoon, horn, and clarinet. The Continental Army relied on these musicians to enhance morale and add to foreshadow, to foreshadow ceremonies. 
The repertoire of fife and drum songs, known as marches or airs, were fairly identical among British and American armies, given the common cultural heritage. One typical air was known as Sailor's Hornpipe. It is likely the second most familiar marching tune to today's listener, behind Yankee Doodle, as it has been woven into the theme song Popeye the Sailor Man. So, while the British fifers and drummers might have played it at this tempo, the Continental musicians might have trained at this speed. While the tune to you Yankee Doodle has a disputed origin, its, its original lyrics, circa 1750, are attributed to British army surgeon who was mocking the colonial provisional army. Patriot statesman Francis Hopkinson parodied the parody by penning the lyrics known as the Battle of the Kegs, based on a story of two powder kegs primed and sent into a river in New Jersey so that they would explode on contact. Here's verse two of six. These kegs now hold the rebels bold, packed up like pickled herring, and they're come down to attack the town in this new way of ferrying. Therefore, prepare for bloody war, these kegs must all be routed, or surely we despised will be, and British courage doubted. Hopkinson went on to sign the Declaration of Independence, and purportedly published the first music book in American history, Seven Songs for the Harpsichord. In 1778, Hopkinson wrote a toast in honor of General Washington. Its words capture the adoration felt for the commander of the Continental Army. Tis Washington's health, our hero to bless. May heaven look graciously down. Oh, long may he live, our hearts to possess, and freedom still call him her own. William Billings, America's first composer of sacred music, wrote American lyrics to a British march entitled Chester. This became the anthem of the Continental Army. The lyrics resemble a hymn as much as a march. When God inspired us for the fight, their ranks were broke, their lines were forced, their ships were shattered in our sight or swiftly driven from our course. Some war music lauded other heroes, both civilian and soldier. While the stories might have been exaggerated, they were hardly abbreviated. One particular ballad, heralding John Paul Jones, had 14 verses. Other songs taught the alphabet using war references or satirized Mother England as a doting parent reddened with rage, with daughter America as a defiant child, as in the ballad, The Rich Lady Over the Sea, written following the Boston Tea Party. On June 19th of 1778, the Continental Army left this encampment, refreshed, renewed, refocused, and resolved with music playing a role. I'm standing again at Bednagel Evangelical Lutheran Church in Palmyra, Pennsylvania, which was dedicated as an official church in 1745. Prior to that date, German families in the vicinity worshiped together around family altars with a lay minister named John Caspar Stover, traveling from home to home. Music performed here would have been sung a cappella in the native German tongue. While Presbyterians preferred Psalters, Martin Luther's descendants enjoyed hymnals with printed lyrics and the unprinted melodies learned experientially. The church archives here include several pieces of continental money in such unique denominations as one-sixth and one-third of a dollar. General Washington had asked Congress to print money 
with which to pay soldiers, in part to discourage desertion. Even though the currency had questionable value, the fact that soldiers were giving their offerings to God suggests that the worship experience, including music, was meaningful to them. In the waning years of the 18th century, with the war behind them, partisan politicians nonetheless led to some singing of nasty lyrics. Political opponents used music to ravage each other's personal goals, priorities, and political campaigns. For the large part, however, music played a unifying function within the communities of our nation. The lyrics attempted to portray the young republic in metaphors of a building, a ship, a family, a physical body. Committees prepared poems, toasts, cheers, and of course music to highlight annual events like George Washington's birthday, Independence Day, and the anniversary of Thomas Jefferson's inauguration. In the words of Kristen, Kirsten Wood, music which encouraged musical harmony spoke to the possibility of future political harmony. Quote, it provided newly independent Americans with an inspiring set of reasons to believe and feel that their political union would endure. To me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. <laughs> 